Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of The Dean Show, which is a way of life we try to put out there for everyone to see, helping you understand Islam and Muslims. And my next guest is one who is well known in the Muslim community, who has intensively studied different religions and has been active in the Dawah for many years. I'm very honored to have him as our guest here on The Dean Show. Shabir Ali, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi How are you, Shay? Alhamdulillah, fantastic. Thank you for being with us today. It's my pleasure, really, Akhi. So, we want to get straight to the to the topic here, which is Dawah. Dawah, which is a, a a duty on every Muslim to invite people to this beautiful message of Islam. Can you give us some advice now, where you see many mis Muslims are not fulfilling this duty? Can you elaborate on this a little bit? Yes, uh, Dawah is a very important responsibility of, of Muslims and yet uh, you are right, many Muslims do not uh, understand this as a responsibility and hence do not fulfill it. But we find in the Quran that uh, uh, there is a direct command from Allah to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Call to the way of your Lord. And uh, as much as the Prophet sallallahu is our example, we have to follow that example. In uh, Surah Yusuf, uh, one, uh, ayah number 112, uh, or, or rather 108, Allah uh, tells the Prophet, peace be upon him, to say that this is my way. I call to the way of my Lord with clear evidence, I and those who follow me. So it's not only he that does it, but also his followers. And if we claim to be followers of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then naturally we should be giving that message as well. Now you've been doing dawah, inviting people to submission and to surrender to the creator of the heavens and earth, alone without no partners, for many years. Now what enticed you to go ahead and study not only your way of life, which is a way of life for all mankind, but to study Christianity, uh, Judaism, uh, Buddhism, what enticed you to do this? Well, uh, in the end, we have to say this is the blessing of Allah uh, on me that He has uh, inspired me or uh, guided me to follow this path and, and to learn uh, about the world's religions in this way. But if we ask about the natural causes, we can say that uh, people came knocking on my door to uh, entice me to follow some other religion. And I've always had a curious mind. I like to get to the bottom of things. It was not enough for me to just simply say, look, Islam is the truth, and I'm a Muslim because Islam is the truth. I, I wanted to know how true it is, and, and in what way is it true, and, and why not something else? So I had to study to satisfy myself that what I believe really is true, and that it can withstand the attacks and the criticisms that other la others launch against it. And by extension, I wanted to study the other faiths as well to see what the faith followers uh, present as evidence for the truth of their own belief systems and to see whether th those pieces of evidence actually do measure up uh, against scrutiny and, and criticism. Did that strengthen your faith even more? Definitely, because it, it's, it's one thing to say, look, I believe. But it's another thing to uh, quietly, confidently, in, in, in a laid-back manner, to be able to say, look, I have studied whatever is out there, and uh, I, in the end, conclude that what I have is really the truth. Uh, that uh, is a conviction that comes uh, after looking at the evidence. Of course, I'm not saying that all faith uh, is, it, it depends on evidence. There is a certain element of faith, but that comes after the evidential matters have been explored. So evidence takes us to a certain extent and we can build faith on top of that. But faith should not be a replacement for evidence. Tell us, give us some advice. You have a lot of experience in this area for the person that wants to do dawah and now he might have watched some Ahmadi Dot videos and he likes his style or he watched some other person and you know these debates that go on between people of other faiths and Muslims you've been in a lot of them all right sometimes it ends up like a boxing match <laughs> so give us some uh, some advice on what's the best way to go about talking to someone who is of an other faith in our uh, modern uh, context, uh, when we're dealing with uh, very illiterate societies, uh, people are, are not attracted to the idea of um, the boxing match approach where you know, we try to disprove other faiths and prove ours to be true. 
but there is a great scope for dialogue and for understanding. Uh, the major problem we're facing is that uh, the, the vast majority of Americans, for example, do not uh, understand much about Islam. And what they know about Islam just ain't so. And our uh, responsibility then is to convey to them the message in a way that is palatable, that they can understand and appreciate. And dialogue sometimes uh, gives us the opportunity, dialogues give us the opportunity to present the message uh, when they're listening. Uh, if we had just simply a lecture and we invited people to come out, they may not have. But if we have a dialogue, it is already understood that people of both faiths would be coming out and should be coming out and uh, supporters of the other uh, speaker will naturally come to the event and that will give them an opportunity to hear directly from a Muslim Imam for the first time perhaps a, a positive presentation of the message of Islam. More than this, it often uh, is such that uh, the, the other speaker, though a Christian, may already have studied Islam to a certain extent and appreciate some f features of Islam. And that person may actually tell his audience uh, the degree to which he already appreciates Islam. And his audience may never have expected that this could be a Christian response to Islam. They might have thought that as Christians, they have to ne necessarily reject everything Islamic. And, and when their pastor or preacher or minister tells them uh, that from his own study he has come to appreciate certain aspects of Islam, that already uh, is a message uh, in favor of us and uh, it already relieves us of some of the burden of having to explain this from scratch. Now, tell me, I get very excited because the message of submission and surrender to the creator of the heavens and the earth is very simple. It fits like a glove to what you have already embedded in you inside. It brings solace to the heart. And I'm very earnest about delivering this in a very simple way because the message is simple. Now, what do you do when you come across someone who you know that when that person has, hasn't been exposed really and when you tell him, don't you agree that the Creator is one, that you worship Him alone, he's like, yes, yes, and you know, it, it's very simple to, to communicate with a person like this. But on the flip side, when somebody has studied Islam now and it seems like his intentions are somewhat off, he takes snapshots of the Prophet, the last and final message of the mankind, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, snapshots of his life and he'll start quoting you certain hadith, certain things out of context and it looks like he's trying to maybe shake your faith or the faith of the Muslim. You've come across people like this, how do you deal with them, Shaykh? <laughs> Well, sometimes uh, it's a quicker explanation um, of their, of their um, questions or, or a simple answer to their questions is really uh, to refer to the scriptures that they already believe in. Uh, it is said that uh, the best uh, defensive is often a well-calculated offensive. And um, uh, you see, if, if somebody wants to be critical and, and, and hypercritical, and uh, just wants to find faults, then sometimes it doesn't matter how m much or how well you answer them, it never, it never budges from where they started uh, with their questioning. So if you turn the tables around and start asking them about certain passages of the scriptures that they already believe in, then that helps matters very simply. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, the Quran has a verse which speaks about the cutting of the, of the th uh, hands of the thieves, both male and female. Yes. So many launch uh, an objection against Islam on this score, saying that this is a barbaric practice. Now I'm not saying what should be done in our modern context here, and, and if I were to answer the question I would, I would go into the details of this. But if I'm dealing with somebody who doesn't really want to hear the answer and just wants to find fault with Islam, I might point out that in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 25 verse 11, uh, it says that if, um, if two men are struggling with each other and a woman were to grab uh, the, the other man uh, by a certain area uh, in defense of her own husband, then you are to cut off her hand and show her no mercy. Well, uh, here we have a, a biblical verse about the cutting off of a hand for a certain reason. And, and one might say that uh, this does not seem to be a very good reason because in a situation like that, naturally the woman would uh, rush forward to help her husband. And, and it seems that her offense was that she grabbed the other man 
where she was not supposed to. Yeah. Uh, whereas the, the Islamic requirement, uh, as was traditionally done, of cutting the hand of the thief was for the purpose of uh, ensuring the safety and security of all citizens in an area. Uh, and, and the rationale for that seems uh, well uh, based on, on reasonable grounds. Uh, so, answering it with reference to the biblical verse uh, just simply closes the issue very quickly rather than having to go into a long explanation. We're coming to a close. I wanted to let you, for our viewers, non-Muslims who are tuning in for the first time to the Dean Show, and you know what, they like what we have to say, and they want to know more about Islam. Can you first deliver the message real simply, plainly, as I had talked about, to the non-Muslim, explain to them what the main message of Islam is and then how they can actually contact you and you have a website that they can visit for more information also. Sure. Well, the, the message of Islam simply, folks, is that there is only one God. Uh, all philosophical arguments uh, regarding uh, proofs for the existence of God actually point to the belief in one God. Uh, the biblical prophets, uh, whether we speak of uh, Abraham or Moses or Jesus, they all spoke about the belief in one God. The, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, Moses spoke of one God. In the uh, Gospel according to Mark chapter 12 verse 27, Jesus speaks of one God. Uh, the prophet Muhammad in whom be peace was inspired by God to deliver a message that there is only one God and he uh, was obviously the messenger of that one God. It is from his message uh, that uh, Islam now comes to be established. The religion of Islam then is uh, simply based on that uh, belief that was already established uh, by reason and confirmed by divine revelation given to uh, God's prophets uh, over time. The Quran is a book revealed to the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, a divine revelation as a guidance to all humankind. And it is to this book that we invite you. We ask you to uh, have a chance to read the book of God and find out for yourself that God really speaks to you through this book. If you'd like more information, you can contact me by visiting a website on which my articles are posted, www.islaminfo.com islaminfo, I-S-L-A-M-I-N-F-O dot com. Sheikh, thank you very much for being with us. Jazakallah <laughs> Haider, we look forward to having you again. It's my pleasure, Akhi. Jazakallah Haider for your excellent work. May Allah thank you. Thank you. Give you barakah and help your work to prosper. Well, yeah, thank you, you too. <laughs> and I thank everybody for tuning in to The Dean Show. Remember, every week here, thedeanshow.com, T-H-E-D-E-E-N show.com. We bring you a new show every week. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you again next time. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. May Allah's peace, mercy and blessings be upon you. Welcome once again to your show, The Dean Show. To this part of it, Mailbag, where we answer your questions. Today's question is an interesting question. And in light of perhaps what, may, what some may have heard or seen of different public figures having said all religions are the same, this questioner asks, Aren't all religions the same? Good question. It's a really good question. The reality is this. In Islam, we believe that the origins of all these religions were the same. Meaning, that the ultimate absolute truth is that there is only one God. Allah, in the Arabic. The one unique God. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, the glorified, the most high, he is the same one who has created man and has intended for man a noble purpose in creation. And because of that, it is he who sent to mankind different prophets and messengers with a message, revelation, calling them all to that divine manual, that divine guide of how we should live life so that we can maximize unhappiness in this world internally and externally, and likewise, even more importantly, in the life hereafter. And so, each and every prophet came with the same teaching. 
the same religion or way of life known in Arabic as Islam. And that is complete voluntary submission to the one God. And in doing so, you, the servant of God, the living, the most merciful, attain inner happiness and peace and salvation in the hereafter. However, mankind is the person who has changed the actual teachings. And this is where we get the different religions from. Mankind is the one who actually took the original pure, pristine revelation and message and adultered it, corrupted it, changed it to suit their desires, their wants, instead of it being in accordance with their needs, which was the actual revelation, the message that God Almighty sent for them. And so, in origin, all religions came from the one God, were basically the same main message of messages of belief in the one God, living a life of righteousness, obeying His commandments, refraining from the prohibitions, emulating the messenger, the prophet that was sent to you, and in doing so you will have happiness in this world and salvation, eternal bliss and, par and paradise in the hereafter. But since the reality is that all of these different religions have changed, and that's why if we were to compare them, you'll find that each one has its own creed. It has its own dogmas of beliefs and acts of worship that make it different from others. Not only that, but you'll find that even within a religion, you'll have different denominations or sects that have formed from them. And so, if we realize that, we'll come to see that they're not all the same. They're not all spokes on the same rim leading to the same core God. Perhaps that would be a nice thing, and perhaps it's a view that may bring something of, of hope or happiness to a person, but we need to be true to ourselves. Can a person who, for example, believes that the cow is God and therefore it is holy and that you cannot and is divine and that you cannot in any way harm it, be equal to a person who enjoys having beef burgers and steaks, seeing that there's no problem with it? Can we equate, for example, Hinduism with what we find of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? where they hold the cow to be divine and therefore they cannot in any way harm it and they're inundated with cows where they can't even sell it to, to different markets to make money off of it because they would be selling their God. Where with us, it's something that we can do. And then take a look at these three monotheistic Abrahamic faiths. You'll see that even within them, there's differences that make them stand apart. In Judaism and Islam, we believe that the oneness of God is uncompromising, absolute, one. There is no belief in God having a son, that Jesus is his son, and that there's a third part of this, this Godhead of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, when you look at what Islam itself teaches, you'll find that there are some core similarities, but the general greater picture itself you'll find that it's very different. You'll find that perhaps all of these religions may have same teachings where they profess belief and love in God or some gods and to live a life of righteousness, to worship, to do things and to pre prevent yourself or to refrain from other things. But at the core, you'll find that salvation can only be one. Salvation can only be when you truly submit and surrender yourself to God's will, to God's teachings. And if you look at these religions, you will find that they have been changed. They are distorted. Their messages are not the original messages, therefore they themselves are no longer applicable today. And this is why we believe, as God Almighty Himself tells us, that only the revelation of the Qur'an is to remain pure, is to remain uncorrupted. And it's not because Muslims are special people that they're the ones who've done this. Because God Almighty Himself, who intended the final Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, and the final revelation that he accompanied, the Qur'an, that God Almighty Himself would preserve it, would protect it, so that no one would mess with it, that no one would be able to corrupt it, and that if they did, the backups, the security measures are so stringent, so strong, so well established and built in that those individual efforts would have no effect upon the whole. 
Why? Because Islam as it is now through the final prophet it would have to remain this way until the end of days until the day of judgment and so this is why brothers and sisters if you were to look at and compare Islam with the others you will realize that they are not all the same that they are not all the same at all because if you take the shahada the testimony of faith the main thing that must be said professing what you should believe in your heart that there is only one God and that Muhammad is his prophet and messenger what other religion tells you to affirm those two? None except for Islam. And to believe in one God alone is not enough because without the proper guidance, without the proper understanding, and that understanding is only with the final prophet and messenger, then you'll be worshipping God based upon what? Your rationale, based on upon what? Your feelings, on your emotions, on what your fathers have done in the past, upon what your pastor, priest, uh, whoever it is of, of, of religious figure tells you or shows you, how would you know then? What clarity do you have? And so because of this, we say that all religions are not the same and that the way to God is only one way. It has always been only one way and it will continue to only be one way and that is the straight path to Him, the path of humbly, voluntarily, lovingly, living your life according to the teachings, the final teachings that he sent with his final prophet and messenger. This is Islam, the complete way of life. Thank you very much. And until next time, Assalamu Alaikum, peace be with you.